We noticed it was taking her a little longer to get out of the tank, but when you're watching it from the, the wings of the show, it just looks like she's moving around normal. Uh, and, but then we noticed after it started getting up around um, two minutes, 40 seconds, that she wasn't picking any of the locks on top. So we came in, and when I came in, she was basically just asleep in the water, which, you know, just scared me to death. So they gave her CPR, you know, to, uh, to revive her, and she was gone for about a minute. And the weirdest thing ever, after a whole minute of terror, she wakes up and just looks up and says, did I get out? My name is Dinky Gowen. I was born June 2nd, 1966, and my parents were Joe and Lily Gowen. My mom was born in Gleanings, Kentucky, which is not too far from here. My dad came from Greene County, uh, Kentucky. Um, in his early age, he started doing auto body work, and that's what he did all the way up his whole lifetime was auto body work. Uh, my mom, Lily, she worked out here at the Joel Ray Sprouls uh, Enterprises at the uh, Lincoln Jamboree. She worked out there for, I think, about 25 years. Uh, my dad had a good friend named Dinky, and obviously I guess I did things that reminded him uh, of him. So he started calling me Dinky when I was about two years old. And having older siblings, uh, that caught on pretty quick. I was born in Louisville in the Valley Station area. And uh, we lived up there until I was uh, right at six years old. And then dad got a job down here in Buffalo doing auto body work. So then we moved there in 72, and that's pretty much where I grew up at in Buffalo. First recollection I have, I was five years old. I still remember it very clearly. Uh, we lived in Louisville, uh, and every single day, there was a gentleman that came on television. Uh, he called himself Presto the Clown. And uh, Presto would do these little interactions in between cartoons. You know, he, they would have a cartoon and then they would cut to Presto and Presto would always do some type of magic effect. And that's when I was five. And I thought that was the greatest thing ever. So I already knew that was something I was really interested in. Then when we moved to Hodgenville a year later, when I was six, uh, there used to be a little store here called Bird's Grocery. And my mom went in that store one day and I remember they had just a little small magic set and she bought that magic set for me. I came home and I practiced that. I thought, that's, that's, that's what I want to do. I knew that's where I was going, right there at six years old. And then um, in those days, I, I would put up posters all through the house and I would advertise my magic show and uh, I'd put a, a 10 cents admission and then uh, the big day came and only mom showed up. <laughs> And I would do a magic show for mom, and, and I know I would aggravate her to death, cause, but she was so great because when I would do these magic tricks for her, uh, as a kid, like six, seven, eight years old, I would do the same trick over and over and over for her, but she always pretended like it was the first time she seen it. And that's the way I started uh, uh, doing my magic shows, and that's kind of the way I got into it. When I was a kid, there wasn't a whole lot of... Uh, live magic shows. You know, you really didn't go to a live magic show at first. And uh, Doug Henning was the first one basically on the scene that kind of uh, brought magic back. Magic was a dying art at that time. Back in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, uh, most of your magicians wore the tuxedo, the top hat, you know, the traditional style. And then Doug Henning hit the scene and he was just totally different. Uh, he was a hippie from the 70s and here comes this young kid, you know, early 20s, wearing blue jeans, buddy tennis shoes, a uh, floweredly shirt that was all decked out in rhinestones or something, you know, something totally different. Uh, but when I lived in Buffalo, all we had was this little black and white 13-inch television. That's what we had. And at that time, you only had four channels. You had 311, 13, 41, I believe is what we had. And uh, I can never forget, like, uh, my mom would sit in the living room and, and that TV would get so staticky and you couldn't watch it. And, and Doug only came on once a year. And in those days, if you missed a show, you missed a show because you weren't going to record it, you weren't going to see it again. Uh, and uh, mom would sit in the living room and, and I would be out there twisting that antenna, trying to, you know, to get that uh, picture to come in just right. 
I remember once, uh, and like I said, Doug only came on once a year, so it was real important to be able to see him because if you, you, knew, you didn't catch him that night, that was it. And I remember that uh, the uh, TV antenna that night, it was doing a lot of blowing around. We couldn't, we couldn't get it. And luckily, my grandpa lived about uh, a mile up the road in an old farmhouse. And my mom took me and we walked up there. I, I was probably seven, eight years old. And we walked all the way to my grandpa's house and, and, and watched that television show, Doug. She made sure that I didn't miss Doug Henning. And also in those days, the way, you know, in the, there was no VCRs, nothing like that. So what I would do, I bought a cassette recorder and I would take the microphone, put it up to the television, and that's the way I got a lot of patter for my presentations because I would listen to how Doug structured the show and all, I, I had to visualize it, you know, in those days and then play it back on the, uh, uh, the voice recorder to hear how he kind of put everything together. And that's the way I figured out how to put those early shows together. When I first started, uh, I remember when I was in the seventh grade, they would let me check out of school and go to, uh, back to Buffalo Elementary because Terry Sandage would let me come in and do magic shows. And I never will forget, he paid me $15 is what he paid me to come in and do a show. And in those days, you know, I thought it took so much time to sit up. So they would let me take the whole day off of school. I would go in about 7.30, 8 o'clock. I know I was aggravating Terry Sanders to death because I was taking up his gym time the whole day. But he allowed me to do that you know, without fussing or anything. And uh, I would do those shows. And I did a lot of shows for Terry from seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade on up. Uh, some of my earliest show, shows was for Joel Ray Sprouse right out here. And, and, it, and my mom working there didn't hurt any because, you know, she got me a little bit of a connection with Joel Ray. And I can still remember to this day just being nervous sick. Joel Ray called me and said, hey, I might be interested in having you come out here and do the magic show, but you got to audition first. So I go out there to the Lincoln Jamboree and, and I'm on stage and I can remember uh, only one person was watching me, it was Joel Ray sitting right in the middle, uh, in the front row there, you know, very nerve wracking. But uh, he, he liked what I did. Uh, so uh, he would give me some shows in the restaurant, the old restaurant out there before it burned down. If it wasn't for my mom, uh, I wouldn't have been able to do any shows. Uh, when I was a kid, my mom would run me from place to place and she was working constantly also but you know most of my shows on weekends or at nights you know and she would make sure i got to and fro and my mom was my roadie <laughs> there was many times you know we went to a show together she would help me unload she'd help me set up uh, you know some of the shows weren't local when i was doing shows in radcliffe or fort knox or something like that you know uh, i was only 11 12 years old and didn't have my driver's license so then my mom would see to it that i got to those places and perform that show and she would take me home so uh, so if it wasn't for her i wouldn't have been able to do anything and then uh, uh, she would loan me money to buy my magic tricks uh, i can remember one of my first performances was at uh, buffalo church uh, buffalo baptist church um, and I, I didn't have a lot of props, but I had just enough to barely get through a show. But I can remember there used to be a place in Louisville called KS Caulfields down on Main Street. But she would run me about mm, once a month to Louisville. And uh, what was so great about those trips was I never will forget that she was scared to death to drive in Louisville. So she had a set way of getting into downtown and a set way of getting out to downtown which meant we walked about five blocks. <laughs> so we would pull in at, I believe it was, um, it was an optometrist that we would pull into, and I'm not for sure what it was, but it was the parking lot there, and mom and I would walk down about five or six blocks and go into the call fields and stay, and she would never rush me. She would let me, you know, get what I wanted, and then we'd walk back to the car and back to Buffalo it was. I remember early on, uh, I sent away in the back of a comic book for some blueprints of magic illusions that I had seen on television. And then once I started doing research, you know, I found out like these magic illusions were thousands of dollars. And coming from a kid's, kid mowing three or four yards a week for two bucks a yard, you wasn't going to buy many magic illusions. So anyway, uh, long story short, I sent away for this, uh, you know, back of the comic book. This uh, I, I still remember it. There was a uh, we could order these blueprints from like I think it was Abbott's Magic Company or something, and they sent me these blueprints. 
And I can remember Dad having some plywood uh, down in the garage, and he gave me plywood. And you know, nowadays you would there's no way you would put a saw in your kid's hand at you know 12, 13 years old, you know. But in those days, life was different. You know, I went to Dad, and Dad said, "Well, there's the saws. You know, build whatever you want to do." And I can remember I got pretty good at it. You know, I got where I could build my own illusions. Um, and did that for many, many years, all the way up to, I was probably in my mid-twenties before my, I had my actual first magic illusion, you know, professional magic illusion. Growing up as a kid, uh, as we've already talked about, my dad was an auto body man, and he handed that down to uh, myself, uh, my brother Ray Taylor, and then I've got another brother, uh, Freddie Going, and they all did body work. Uh, I didn't enjoy it as much as they did. They went on and made lifetime careers out of it. But the great thing about body work, it gave me that opportunity to do magic professionally. Because doing magic in Kentucky uh, in the early days, there was no full-time work. So, you know, you might do a show and then you might have a, you know, you don't know, two, three week gap before you did, did another show and you weren't going to survive very long on a magician's paycheck. So my dad and my brothers taught me how to do body work, and that gave me the opportunity to fill in those voids. So uh, growing up as a kid, uh, my brother uh, Freddie had an auto body shop, and I would go out there, and he pretty much, him and my dad taught me how to do body work, paint cars. So I've always been very lucky, if I didn't have something to do, of figuring out a way of creating my own work. So in body work, instead of me doing a lot of customer work, uh, I got where I would just buy a couple vehicles, I would repair them, and then I would sell them, and then we would, I would take the money from when we sold a car and uh, uh, obviously live off that money, but also there was also extra money to, uh, to buy another vehicle. So, and that gave me full-time work that way. So that filled those voids between doing school shows or birthday parties or you know, whatever you know, there was to do. To, uh, to make a, a full-time living. When I first decided I was going to do shows for a living, uh, I'd worked a couple of different jobs, and I believe um, I worked at Mauser's Kitchen, and then uh, I worked at Walmart pushing in carts, and I remember going home one day and telling my wife, I said, there's no way. I'm gonna do I just don't enjoy that. It's no fun. There's got to be a better way. So she said, well, why don't you try to do more magic shows and less Mauser's Kitchen, you know? So I remember calling my very first school, and it was Memorial Elementary, and there was a gentleman there at that time by the name of Jerry Ralston. I hope I've got that name correct. He was the principal. And Mr. Ralston says, you know, I don't need a magic show. But what I need is a drug education show. He said, do you have one of those? And I said, well, today is your lucky day. Because I have a drug education show, but it just happens to have some magic in it. And he said, good deal. You're booked. So I went down. I did the uh, magic show. I put some drug education quotes in it. And at that time, the Reagans were in office. And I found out that Nancy Reagan was big on the say no to drugs theme. So I knew that was my loop right there. That was my hole in one. So I put the drug education theme to it, and it wasn't long until I was doing every school in Hart County. And then I was doing shows all over the state of Kentucky. And in the, in the 80s, I was doing about 150 school shows per school show season. So, and that's how I started doing the school shows. You know, the, my earliest recollection of Guntown Mountain, I remember a friend of mine, Jeff Despain, who was also in my magic show. I remember in a sixth grade, him coming in and he'd been on vacation. And we never went on a vacation when I was a kid. That's just something we didn't do. My dad's idea of a vacation was driving by it, telling me how great it was. So, <laughs> when he was a kid. <laughs> but he just didn't go on vacation. That's just something we didn't do, you know. Uh, so. But I remember Jeff Despain, first time I'd ever heard of it, brought in a brochure, and uh, it was Guntown Mountain, and there was a magician on it. And, you know, Guntown's only 30 minutes away, but as a kid, 
that seemed so far away. And it was just untouchable. It had been like going to Disney World for me. It was just untouchable, you know, to me. So I remember um, then I kind of uh, uh, I started going up to Guntown Mountain back in, I'd say, 84, 85. And I, I met a magician up there, and, and um, he was doing the magic shows there. He'd been there for many years. And I thought, man, this would be fantastic to be able to do shows up here every single day. And then, uh, as luck would have it, I guess bad luck for the magician that was there, but uh, uh, he left because another gentleman came in and bought it. The gentleman that bought it, uh, uh, he was the manager for years, and then he bought Guntown Mountain. And when he bought Guntown Mountain, he gave me the opportunity to become the magician, which was fantastic. So uh, that's kind of the way the whole Guntown Mountain started. So I was there for seven years, from 99 to 2007. And uh, it was it was a great place to perform. And in those days, um, it was hopping, man. I mean, it was you know on a good day, like when, especially around Fourth of July or Memorial Weekend, you know, wasn't nothing to have 2,500 people on pulling that hill. Around 2005, 2006, every single year, uh, you could see the audience was just dwindling, dwindling just a little bit. So, and then I kept hearing about Beach Bend, and I had never, ever even been to Beach Bend. So, I remember around 2005, I went down, I, I talked to them, and they had no interest in having any live shows whatsoever. A gentleman owns it by the name of Dallas Jones. So then, uh, I went again in 2007. Basically, I guess he thought I was just aggravating him to death. And then finally, he said, you know what, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, I'm not interested in any live shows. He said, but come down and do just one show for me. He said, I've got this little get together. You come in, do a show. So he said, we'll do it next summer. So the following summer, I went down and they had started a little bit of having like a uh, kind of a rock and roll show, but they still weren't interested in magic shows. So I never will forget, they put me on at uh, a seven o'clock spot and we had a huge crowd for the magic show. So Mr. Jones came and watched it, and, he, and right after the show, he said, you know what? I said, I'll take as many of those as you can give me. So that was good in a way and bad in a way because I was still working at Guntown Mountain. So uh, Mr. Jones told me, he said, hey, you know what? He said, uh, beginning of next year, why don't you work here? And at that time, you know, you don't want to quit the job you have till you make sure the job you're going to go to is going to work. So I decided... I would be really brave and do both amusement parks. So I would go in at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning at Guntown Mountain. I'd do a show at 10.20. I would do that show until 10 minutes to 11. I would leave Guntown Mountain. I would get in the car at 10 minutes to 11 because at 11.30, I had a show at Beach Bend Park. So I hired one girl uh, would work at Guntown for me. One young lady would work at Beach Bend for me. And I never will forget, I was scared to death there would be a traffic problem going down I-65. And as soon as that show at Guntown was over, I would hop in the car. I would drive straight to Beach Bend Park. And in the early days, my stage was not on the edge of Beach Bend Park, but it was in the middle of Beach Bend Park. So I would get, you know, get to Beach Bend. I would be jogging to get to the stage in the middle of the park. I would get to the stage and literally the pre-show music would be playing and it would always be about two or three minutes before I was supposed to go on stage. I didn't even change clothes. They would hand me a headset mic. I'd walk right on stage at Beach Bend. I would do the show. As soon as I was done that show, back to Guntown. So I would end up doing three shows at Beach Bend a day, three shows at Guntown a day. And I did that for one whole summer without missing a beat. Never, never missed a show. So I did that for a summer. And then the next summer, Guntown Mountain decided that Beach Bend was not in their best interest. They kind of felt like it was competition, you know, for them. So I left Guntown Mountain, went to Beach Bend, which has worked out really well. I'm still at Beach Bend. This is my 15th year at Beach Bend. My wife is also a very, very talented magician does a fantastic show and, and, and she's more of a uh, I guess you'd call her more of a daredevil of sorts and she does a lot of the dangerous stuff in the show which also gives us a little bit of an edge that other magicians don't have you know because she can eat fire 
Uh, she does this Houdini water torture sale, which she has become known for. Uh, there was a lot of publicity here a couple years ago because when she was doing the Houdini water torture cell, she actually basically passed out in the water, which was uh, a, you know, a very frightening thing for all of us. We were in Glasgow, Kentucky, and we were doing a Lions Club magic show. And we all thought she was fine because she had did it many times before and we were so used to watching her go into tank. And that particular day, a lot of her family was at the show. So we noticed it was taking her a little longer to get out of the tank, but when you're watching it from the, the wings of the show, it just looks like she's moving around normal. Uh, and, but then we noticed after it started getting up around um, two minutes, 40 seconds, that she wasn't picking any of the locks on top. So uh, we came in and when I came in, she was basically just asleep in the water, which you know just scared me to death. So. Uh, we brought in the keys, we unlocked it, we opened it up, pulled it out. Uh, they gave her CPR, you know, to, uh, to revive her, and she was gone for about a minute. And the weirdest thing ever, after a whole minute of terror, she wakes up and just looks up and says, did I get out? You know, and uh, she had some water in her lungs, so she had trouble a little bit with uh, uh, breathing and stuff for, for about a year there before we put it, you know, right back in the show. But uh, she's done it several times after that. It's very scary. It's, it's a fantastic uh, escape. Um, she does that. She does a straight jacket. She does fire eating. Uh, I mean, a lot of, she does a lot of cool stuff. I think what uh, a lot of performers miss out today, it's more important to entertain than it is to fool people. And it's more important just to talk to your audience like they're just normal people. And that's what, and that's the reason I enjoy performing so much. I, I'm just as comfortable in front of on a stage in front of uh, 500 people that I am sitting here. You know, I'm that comfortable just because uh, uh, you know I do it all the time, and it's just very, you know, it's like home. It's like being home. Sometimes the show, to me, is not on stage. Sometimes the show, to me, is watching the audience. You know, you get several different types of audience members. You get the, uh, the type that comes in that really wants to have a good time. You get the dad bringing the son where the dad is sitting in the front row and he's got his arms crossed and he's going to try to figure out every single thing that you're doing. And my answer to that, you know, if you watch it close enough, you're going to figure out everything I'm doing. And when you figure out everything I'm doing, no longer is the show going to be any fun. So it's so much better to come to a magic show and just have a good time and let yourself have that sense of wonder. Because you know, with the world being as tough as it is, you know, we've got, you've got bills you can't pay, you've got, you know, so many things that uh, get you down on a daily basis. And you know, if you remember when you were a kid and you'd read the story of something like Peter Pan, how that took you away and how your imagination just went wild. And I think that's what we need today, you know, to get away from all the problems of the world and uh, there's nothing wrong with coming just watching a magic show and just enjoying it. You know, and it's like uh, for a little while you can just be a kid again and you have that childlike wonder of just watching these fantastic things on stage that it would be impossible, you know, to happen. And I think that's just a, a, a joy that we all need. The great thing about my life is I still enjoy working every single day. The one thing that I've always tried to tell my kids, if you can find something that you really love in life and you can do it and you're lucky enough to make a living at it, you're not working. And, you know, and I have been blessed as far as that goes. In all honesty, I don't think I've worked in the last 25 years. I just don't go to work. You know, I go and have fun every single day. I get to talk to people. I get to experience this fantastic world of just, uh, of, of just magic and, and enjoying life. And it's, it's, it's like being a kid every single day when I get up. So in ways, I am Peter Pan. All right, now the first thing we want everybody to know that we haven't set this up. I mean, haven't prearranged, you have no idea what's about to happen. Right. Uh, what I've got, Robin, I've got uh, just a deck of some blank cards. And uh, what we're going to do, I'm going to make sure that you know 
that I can't switch cards on you. I'm going to draw a circle right there. You take this, and you can draw anything you want to in that circle. It doesn't matter. Just make that unique, and you know, I mean, there's no way it would be impossible for me to, uh, to switch cards on you. And we're going to take it and fold it up, put just a little piece of paper in it, and just clip it. Fair enough? All right. All right. Uh, the next thing I've got, I've got a book here, and this book is just full of different celebrities. Arnold Schwarzenegger, and you can see there's no two alike, completely different. Fair enough? Mm -hmm. Now what you're going to do, you're going to pick one of the celebrities, but I want it to be totally at random where nobody thinks I've told you what to pick. You're going to set the book on the palm of your hand, you're going to riffle up, break any place you want to in the book, okay? And then you're going to open it up. There might be one celebrity on the page, might be two. Just pick one of the celebrities, okay? okay? Here, riffle up. Yep, just hold it in palm. Riffle up with your other thing. Stop any place you want to. Break it open, look at the celebrity. If there's one, two, just pick one of them, doesn't matter. You got one? Shut the book. Now, you would say it's pretty much impossible for me to know what celebrity you picked. And you've also, uh, you put your own little special thing on the card where it's impossible for me to switch cards. You remember the celebrity. You hold the card. Now for the very first time, what was the celebrity you picked? Tom Cruise. Tom Cruise. It would have been impossible for me to know it beforehand. Right. Open the blank card. You've heard the old expression, cut the deck. Well, yeah. this time I've already cut the deck, all right? Uh, all the cards are different. And we're going to do this in a way where you know I'm not forcing a card or anything. You're just going to hold that half. Okay. And here's another half. All the cards are different. Now this time, instead of me reading your mind, you're going to read my mind. Okay? Right. So I'm going to go first. And I'm just going to pick out a card at random. Right here. I'm going to lay it right there. So there's my half. So what I want you to do, I want you to do the same thing. You're going to pick out a card at random, okay? Just hold your finger up just like this, place it on the back of any card. Now I really want you to think about it. If you want, right now, you can switch to another card or you can go with that one. What would you like to do? Stay with that. Okay. Pull it, Pull it out? Some, yeah, just, just get it. Got it? Please. All right. Got to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Now you would say that was pretty much at random because I had you pick it after I picked my card. So there's no way I could have forced the card. You turn your card over and let's see what you got. You got the six of clubs. I picked my card before you even picked yours. I would say that's a match. All right, one more. What's great about this is this is gonna happen in your hand, okay? So just hold your hand out. Hold both hands out, let's do both hands. I'm gonna put one in each hand. Now very slowly, I'm gonna put one in my hand, I'm gonna put the other one in your hand. Fair enough, mm -hmm. squeeze. Mm -hmm. Put your other hand on top of it like this, and squeeze, now watch. Because mine is gone. Turn your hand over and open it up. Hey! <laughs> Ha, 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 ha.